Appendix one of Brief Lives, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Brief Lives, Volume two by John Aubrey. Appendix one. Notes of Antiquities. Sir equals Dominus. I remember before the late wars the ministers in Herefordshire, etc., counties that way, had the title of Sir as the bachelors of art have at Oxon, as Sir Richard of Stratford, Sir William of Monkland. And so it was in Wilts, when my grandfather Light was a boy, and anciently everywhere. The example of this appears in the excellent comedy of the scornful lady, where Sir Roger the chaplain has a great part. It was made by Mr. J. Fletcher about the beginning of King James's time, but in all old wills before the Reformation it is upon record. Manuscript Aubrey three, folio 30. The Ways of the Gentry, Tempore, Jacobi I. In those days hunting and falconry were at the height. Old Sergeant Latham then lived and writ his falconry. Good cheer was then much in use, but to be wiser than one's neighbours, scandalous, and to be envied at. And the nobility and gentry were, in that soft peace, damnable, proud, and insolent. Manuscript Aubrey 3, folio 30. Ghost Stories When I was a child, and so before the civil wars, the fashion was for old women and maids to tell fabulous stories, night-times, and of sprites and walking of ghosts, etc., this was derived down from mother to daughter, etc., from the monkish balance, which upheld holy church. For the divines say, Deny spirits, and you are an atheist. When the wars came, and with them liberty of conscience and liberty of inquisition, the phantoms vanish. Now children fear no such things, having heard not of them, and are not checked with such fears. Manuscript Aubrey 3, folio 30. The first point de Venise band that was worn in England was by King Charles I at his coronation. Now it is common. Manuscript Aubrey 6, folio 1. Point bands. The first point band worn in England was that which King Charles the Second wore when he was crowned, and presently after the fashion was followed infinitely. From Mrs. Judith Dobson, Video of Victorious, Manuscript Aubrey 6, folio 11. Apothecaries. Sir Edward Coke, Lord Chief Justice of the King's Bench, says, as I remember, in the College of Physicians' case, that Falconti, an Italian, was the first apothecary in London, but vide Sir Geoffrey Chaucer in his prologue of the Doctor of Physic, sake, fourteenth, thus. Full ready had he his apothecaries to send him drug and electuaries. And Mr. Anthony Alwood shews in his Oxon Antiquities that there was a place there called Apothecaria three hundred years ago. In Queen Elizabeth's time the apothecaries did sell sack in their shops. My grandfather and several old men that I knew heretofore did remember it. Manuscript will be six, folio eleven. Table and pipe. When I was a boy, before the late civil wars, the table and pipe were commonly used, especially Sundays and holy days, and at christenings and feasts, in the marches of Wales, Hereford, Gloucestershire, and in all Wales. Now it is almost lost. The drum and trumpet have put that peaceable music to silence. I believe tis derived from the Greek sistrum, a brazen or iron timbrel, cratalum, a ring of brass, struck with an iron rod. So we play with the key and tongs. Manuscript Borby 6, folio 11. Clocks. Chaucer. Nun's priest tale. Chanticleer. Well, Sicero was his crowing in his lodge, than is a clock, or in an abbey, and all loge. Sir Geoffrey Chaucer, obit 1400, etatis 72, manuscript Aubrey 6, folio 10. The clock at Paul's on the North Cross Isle west side is stately. That at Wells is like it. Vide Chaucer in aliqua vita, manuscript Aubrey 8, folio 10. Spectacles. Dr. Pell tells me the antiquity of spectacles is about two hundred years standing, and that they were sold when first invented for three or five pounds a pair. The ancientest author wherein he finds them is Cardinal Cusa, Vide Cusanum, query Sir John Hoskins, who, I think, knows. Tis Rady, an Italian, about four hundred years since. The Germans call them Brill, from the barrel stone, i.e. crystal, of which they were first made. Cristalos is not properly crystal, but ice. Erasmus in Colloquius Ennis, quid tibi vis cum vitres oculis fascinator, Vide Thomas Hobbes' Optics in Libro de Homini, where he interprets this piece of Plautus in Sistilla Rea, Act I, Scene I. Conspicillo consecutus clanculum meusque ad foris, where he proves that their conspicillo could not signify a pair of spectacles, as we now use it, for then he could not have kenned her at a distance. I remember he told me tis that which the French call videte, a hole to peep out at. Vide here, situus de perspicillis, a thin quarto. Mr. Edmund Wilde has it, Schilicet, a rarity, manuscript Aubrey 6, folio 11. Guns. The Almanac chronology tells us, 1680, since the invention of guns by a monk of, in Germany, 
two hundred and seventy years, Scilicet, in the reign of Henry the Fourth, anno fourteen ten. Philip de Comines tells us that in his time, when Charles VIII went into Italy, the country people flocked mightily to see the great gun shot off, which was the first time they came in use, but muskets and fowling pieces came not to perfection long after. Memorandum in the Prince's chamber at the House of Lords, Scilicet, the room where the king does retire, are very old hangings, viz. of Edward the Fourth's time, in which is described the invention and use of guns. The muskets there are only a long tube stopped at one end, with a touch-hole, and fitted to a long staff. This gun one holds on a rest and aims, and then another comes with a lighted match in a stick and gives fire, so that twas the work of two men then to manage one piece. Till the late wars refined locksmith's work. I remember when I was boy the firelocks were very bungling to what they now are, and in Queen Elizabeth's time they used calivers, of which I remember many in gentlemen's halls before the civil wars, for then the soldiers converted them into carbines. The stock was like a wooden basting ladle, and it had a matchlock, and was not much longer than a carbine. Qualibre in French signifies the bore of a gun, or the size of the bore, and thence also the size of capacity or fashion of any such thing. Colgrove's Dictionary, Manuscript, Aubrey Six, Folio Eleven. Printing. Memorandum. In the Library of Francis Bernard, M.D., in London, behind Sepulchre's Church, is Tulis Offices. Tis printed Tuli, in quarto, printed at Mentz by Johann Fust, 1466. The said doctor says that he hath seen St. Jerome on the Creed, printed at Oxford, 1467. Memorandum, Mr. Morris, of Clancilly, in Denbyshire, hath a manuscript Bible in Welsh, 1500 years old. It was found at the dissolution of the monasteries, in an old wall which parted the monastery from the bishop's palace at Hereford, lapped up in lead, and the inscription on it doth testify the antiquity of it. Tis thought was hid and laid up there when the great difference and troubles was between the Welsh monks and those of Austin the monk, from Mr. Middleton of Denbyshire, merchant in London. Query Mr. Meredith Lloyd de Hoke. There may be something of truth to be picked out in this story. Manuscript Aubrey six, folio eleven. Catafalconi is the magnificent contrivance for kings and princes and generals' effigies to lie in state in some eminent church for some weeks, e.g. King James I, Robert, Earl of Essex, General Monk, Duke of Albemarle. It takes its name from Falconi, which signifies in Italian an eagle. Memorandum at the solemn funerals of the Roman emperors, they had an eagle to fly away from the rogus when it took fire. Manuscript Aubrey eight, folio three. Stained glass in Oxford. When I came to Oxford, crucifixes were common in the glass windows in the studies windows, and in the chamber windows were canonized saints, e.g. in my chamber window, St. Gregory the Great, and another, broken, and scutcheons with the pillar, the whip, the dice, and the cock. But after 1647 they were all broken, down went Dagon. Now no vestigia to be found. Manuscript Aubrey, 8, folio 3. Mr. Fabian Phillips says the winter 1625 before the plague was such a mild winter as this, quote, N.B. Manuscript Aubrey, 8, a slip at folio 6. Query Dick Brocas, prisoner in King's Bench, pro legio book of Bradstock Abbey. Manuscript Aubrey, 8, folio 6. Query Nomen Ecclesiae Unde, de Ducibantur, Picturae. Mary Davis, Manuscript Aubrey, 8, folio 6. Oliver turned out the Parliament, 20th April, 1653. Manuscript Aubrey 8, folio 5. Knox began his voyage to Tonquin, August 18, 1681. Manuscript Aubrey 8, folio 5. The first beginning of the Royal Society, where they put discourse in paper and brought it to use, was in the chamber of William Ball, Esquire, eldest son of Sir Peter Ball of Devon, in the Middle Temple. They had meetings at taverns before, but twas here where it formerly and in good earnest set up. In Dr. Spratt's history you may see when the patent was granted. Manuscript Aubrey 8, a slip at folio 6. Wiltshire. Query Mr. Thomas Marriott and Mr. Packer, pro Anthony Wood, if there is a camp near Camden, and if another on Broadway. Memorandum. To put my brother's notes of Hyde, etc., into Lieber B, before I send it to Anthony Wood. Lieber A, preface, the clerici, i.e. parish priests, did write the bailiff's accounts, and that in Latin, a specimen whereof I have with me of Manuscript Aubrey 8, a slip at folio 13. Oxford. Insert the shields in St. Ebb's Church at Oxford in Liber B. 
Manuscript Aubrey 8, Folio 6. The paper mill at Bemerton Wilts is a hundred and twelve years standing, 1681. Twas the second in England. Manuscript Aubrey 8, Folio 28. Jessamines came into England with Mary, the Queen Mother. Laurel was first brought over by Alethea, Countess of Arundel, grandmother to this Duke of Norfolk. Manuscript Aubrey 8, Folio 28. Rider's Almanac, 1682. Since tobacco brought into England by Sir Walter Raleigh ninety-nine years, the custom whereof now is the greatest of all others, and amounts yearly to. Manuscript Aubrey 8, Folio 103. Rider's Almanac, 1682. Since tobacco first used, ninety-nine years. Since the new river was brought to London, seventy-nine. Since coaches were first used, hundred and twenty-eight. Manuscript Aubrey 8, Folio 28. The first glass coach that came into England was the Duke of York's when the King was restored. In a very short time they grew common, and now, 1681, at Waltham or Tottenham High Cross, is set up a mill for grinding of coach glasses and looking glasses, much cheaper, viz. Manuscript Aubrey 8, Folio 28. Penny Post Office, Vide Vitam Armori. Mr. Robert Murray began it in May 1680, and the Duke of York seized on it in 1682. Query about what time of the year. Let Mr. Murray go to Dr. Chamberlain at Suffolk House. Manuscript Aubrey 8, Folio 30. The Penny Post. Do write to Mr. Murray in a memorandum as to the refelling of Dr. Edward Chamberlain, who ascribes that invention or project of the Penny Post to W. Dockeray, which is altogether false. Manuscript Aubrey 8, a slip at Folio 13. Printing. Mr. J. Gadbury assures me that the first printing in England was in Westminster Abbey. They yet retain the name Treasure of the Chapel, Manuscript Aubrey 8, Folio 28. Mr. Theodore Hark saith that the antiquity of pins is not above two hundred years, before they used a thorn, etc., more primitivo. He says, moreover, that he heard the Swedish ambassador ask two other ambassadors what they thought was the greatest waste of copper. One said bells, another said cannons. No, said he, tis pins. Quod M.B., Manuscript Aubrey 8, Folio 30. Shoes. I do remember in my native county of North Wilts, husbandmen did wear high shoes till 1633, common enough, skeelicket, half-boots, slit and laced. The Benedictine monks wore boots, I believe, like these, at least half-boots. Manuscript Aubrey 8, Folio 30. Gentilism. Memorandum in Yorkshire, the countrywomen do still hail the new moon. Skeelicket. They kneel with their bare knees, on a ground fastine, and say all hail, etc., the moon hath a greater influence on women than on men. Manuscript Aubrey 8, Folio 69. Gentilism. Weddings out. Ovid's Fastorum Lib. 3, 397-398. Hits etiam conjux apia sancta dialis. Lucibus impexas debet habere comas. See the two diastics proceeding. This St. Andrew's cross we wore on our hats, pinned on, till the plot, and never since. Manuscript Aubrey 8, Folio 69. Avebury. Between pages 1 and 2, insert the scheme of Avebury, miles westwards from Marlborough, not far from Bristow Road, is a village called Avebury, which stands within one of the most remarkable monuments of its kind in England. It seems strange to me that so little notice hath been taken of it by writers. Mr. Camden only touches on it, and no more. Manuscript Aubrey 9, Folio 50. Palm Sunday. Antiquity, the fashion hereabout was before the wars, that on Palm Sunday the young men and maids received the communion, and in the afternoon walked together under the hedges about the cornfields, which was held to be lucky. Manuscript Aubrey 21, Folio 2. Simples. Some write that the water, vervain, of sprinkled about the hall, or place where any feast or banquet is kept, maketh all the company both lusty and merry. Dolan's Herbal. Manuscript Aubrey 21, a slip at Folio 9. Witches, Malefice. Twisting of trees, tearing and turning up oaks by the roots, raising tempests, Racking ships, throwing down steeples, blasting plants, dwindle away young children, to overlook and bind the spirits and fantasy, bewattling and making men impotent, women miscarry, Countess of Carlisle, whirlwinds, hurricanes, Mr. Morehouse, spirits in him, Bishop of Bahues, the devil's black mace of ram's horns, the session a la mode de royal society with balloting box, memorandum, Sir H. B. said, wise men always saw that as some malicious women increased in years, increased also in malice, set houses on fire, mischief to children, etc., thought it better to have them underground than above ground and raise storms, the familiars could not handsomely knock em in the head. 
Manuscript Aubrey 21, page 11. Provincial Ignorance. Sir Eglamour and Fitzale, two of the persons in Aubrey's comedy, The Country Rebel, discourse of the Gothic manner, of living of these gentlemen, of their ignorance and envy of civilised and ingenious men, of the promising growth of civility and knowledge in the next generation, in our grandfather's or great-grandfather's days, few gentlemen could write a letter, then the clerk made the justice, that there is a sort of provincial wit, or rather a humour that goes for wit, e.g. in the west, which if used in the north or elsewhere, seems strange and ridiculous. Manuscript Aubrey 21, page 11. Summer Watch. Vide Sir Thomas Smith's Commonwealth de Hake. Cause is that the blood is then high. Keep down the juvenilis impetus. The old men in those days were not so ignorant in philosophy as the virtuosi, forsooth, do think they were. They knew, etc. Manuscript Aubrey 21, page 11. Provincial Manners. Collect the Gothicisms and clowneries of in Chester. Dick Paulet, Seacole Chivers, W. Duckett's clan of Clown Hall. Their servants like clowns too, drunkards too, qualis Harris, talis service, breeches of one sort, doublet of another, drabble with the tears of the tankard and greasy. He built an alehouse for his servants without the gate, for convenience sake, because the servants should be within call. Before they came hither above a mile for their ale, vide Osborne, of distinction of habits, manuscript Aubrey 21, page 12. Country Magic Walking about the church midsummer eve at night, one shall meet the party that shall marry. They must go round the church nine times, or seven times, with a sword drawn, if a man, if a woman, with a scabbard, to put a smock on the hedge on midsummer eve night, the man that is to have her shall come and turn it. They take orpin and stick branches of it on the wall, and fancy such a branch for such a man, such a branch for such a woman, and divine their loves and marriage, or not marriage, by the inclining or aversion of the branches. They tie magical knots with certain grasses, which, put in the bosom of the man or woman, if their love have not love for them, will untie. Manuscript Aubrey 21, folio 24. Sketches for designed inventions. Manuscript Aubrey 21, folio 57. Illustrated in most cases by drawings. One, folio 57, is for a cart with one wheel, imitated from the slids in the forest of Dean, for their narrow ways where carts can't pass. Another, folio 57, is for a balloon. Fill or force in smoke into a bladder, and try if the bladder will not be carried up in the air. If it is so, several bladders may draw a man up into the air a certain height, as the holly berries arise to the middle of water in a glass. Memorandum, try to what height they will ascend in a deep vessel, and also try other berries, if any will do so. Another, folio 57, is for flying machine and parachute. Memorandum, to propose that Mr. Packer sends to Norfolk or Suffolk, to the gentleman that hath with much curiosity measured the feathers in the wings of several birds, and taken proportions of them and the weight of their bodies, and to send to Mr. Francis Potter for his notions of flying, and of being safely delivered upon the ground from great heights with a sheet, etc. Another, folio 58, is for sailing a ship. Memorandum, Dr. Wilkins, his notion of an umbrella-like invention for retarding a ship when she drives in a storm. Another, folio 59, is for a sewing machine. Let a gin be invented to shout out corn by jogging instead of sewing or setting, the one being too wasteful, the other taking up too much time, and that the sewing and harrowing may be but one and the same labour. Herefordshire. All the earth red, as also all Wales from Severn to the sea. The twanging pronunciation more here than in South Wales. In North Wales, not much. So about Newcastle they speak more of the Scotch twang than they do at Berwick or Scotland. Get the song or speech of Sergeant Hoskins of the Earl of Northampton, the Lord President of Wales. At Mordford, the serpent with six or eight wings, every a pair. Vide the little books of the old Earl of Worcester in Duodecimo, where, amongst other things, he mentions a profaci by a bard of Raglan, that it should be burned or destroyed, and afterwards be rebuilt out of redwood. Set forth, fide, I think, by Dr. Thomas Bailey, his chaplain, where be many pretty romances of that Earl, etc., his life and death, etc. The same doctor also writ a book in folio, within, called Parietaria, which see. He, or his father, would shoe his horse. Was a great patron to the musicians, e.g. Caporavio, etc. This duke's father had an excellent mechanical head, query what he writ. Mr. Wilde, I think, hath the book printed in red. Manuscript, Aubrey 31, page 68. Monmouthshire. About the beginning of Queen Elizabeth's time, Welsh was spoken much in Hereford, and, I believe, one hundred years before that, as far as the seven. It wears out more and more in South Wales, especially since the civil wars, and so in Cornwall. Mr. Francis Potter did see one that spake of a woman towards the farther end of Cornwall that could speak no English. 
but they still retain their ancient way of pronunciation, which is with a twang worse than the Welsh. Manuscript Aubrey 21, page 68. Dress. Memorandum. Anciently, no bands worn about their necks but fur, as in old glass pictures. Memorandum. Till Queen Elizabeth's time, no hats but caps, i.e. bonnets. Trunk hose in fashion till the later end of King James I. About ninety years ago, 1670, noblemen and gentlemen's coats were of the fashion of the bedles and yeomen of the guard, i.e. gathered at the girdle place, and our bench's gowns retain yet that fashion of gathering. Manuscript Aubrey 21, folio 95. By reason of fasting days, all gentlemen's houses had anciently fish ponds and fish in the moats about the house. Manuscript Aubrey 31, folio 95. Heretofore, glass windows were very rare, only used in churches and the best rooms of gentlemen's houses. Yea, in my remembrance, before the civil wars, copyholders and ordinary poor people had none. Now the poorest people, that are upon alms, have it. In Herefordshire, Monmouth, Salop, etc., it is so still, but now this year, 1671, are going up no less than three glass houses between Gloucester and about Worcester, so that glass will be common over all England. Manuscript Aubrey 21, folio 95. Memorandum. Without doubt, before the Reformation there was no county in England, but had several glass painters. I only remember one poor one, an old man, Harding, at Blandford, in that trade. Manuscript Aubrey 21, folio 95. Riding at the Quintin at weddings is now left in these parts, but in the west of England is sometimes used yet. I remember when I learned to read English, I saw one at Will Tanner's wedding, set up at the green by Barnet House, by the pound. Vide the mask of Ben Jonson, where is a perfect description of riding at the Quintin. Query the antiquity and rise of it. Memorandum, I saw somewhere that riding at the Quintin is a remain of the Roman exercise. Vide Juvenal, Satyr, 6248. Aut quis non videt vulnera pali, quem cavet assiduus sudibus scutoque lacesit, atque omnes implet numeros. A Quintin, Quintain in French. A, a leather satchel filled with sand. B, a roll of corn pitched on end in some crossway or convenient place where the bride comes along home. C, at this end the fellows that bring home the bride give a lusty bang with their clubs or truncheons, which they have for the purpose, and if they are not cunning and nimble, the sandbag takes them in the pole ready to hit them off their horses. They ride a full career when they make their stroke. A. C. A piece of wood about a knell long that turns on the pin of the roller. E. Manuscript Aubrey 21, folio 95. Chelsea Hospital. On Thursday morning, February the 16th, 1681-2, His Majesty laid the foundation stone of the college, appointed for the relief of indigent officers at Chelsea College. Manuscript Aubrey 23, folio 20. Siamese Twins, May 19, 1680. About sun rising were born at Hillbrewers near Ilminston, Somerset, twin sisters grown together at the belly, christened Aquila and Priscilla. Query the judgment by Dr. Bernard. Manuscript Aubrey 33, folio 92. Roll right stone, except one, two, the rest, plus or minus four foot, about, four and a half, query, quote, manuscript, Aubrey 23, a slip at folio 92, apparition, 1679, as he was abed sick of an egg, he awake, daytime, came to him the vision of a master of arts with a white wand in his hand, and told him that if he lay on his back three hours, viz. ten to one, that he should be rid of his egg, he was weary, and turned, and immediately the egg came, after he did not, etc., and was perfectly well, manuscript, Aubrey 23, a slip at folio 100. Soap. A Bristow man, living in Castile in Spain, learned the art of making soap, which he did first set up in Bristow about the year 1600. By this, Alderman Rogers there got a great estate, and Mr. Broughton was the first that improved barren ground there with the soap ashes, now not uncommon. Manuscript Aubrey 26, page 18. A Bristow man, living in Castile in Spain, learned the art of making soap, which he first set up in Bristow, now, 1681, eighty-plus years since. Manuscript Aubrey 8, folio 28. The Fishmonger's Company, London. To discover and find out the lands, concealed and embezzled, by the Fishmonger's Company, which was to maintain so many scholars in Oxford, and for the ease of poor Catholics in Lent. Mr. Fabian Phillips tells me, I may find out the donation in Stowe's survey of London. He can put me in a way to help me to a third or fourth part for the discovery. J. Collins, who informed me of this discovery, said the lands are worth some thousands per annum, skilica at two or three thousand pounds per annum, which devout Catholics in ancient times gave to this company for their pious and charitable use. My Lord Hunsdon would be a good instrument herein. 
Memorandum in the records of the tower are to be found many grants, etc., to the fishmonger's company. Edmund Wilde, Esquire, saith that the old Parliament did intend to have had an inspection into charitable uses. See Sir Richard Baker's Chronicle, page 267G, Anno 22, Henry 7, 1507, Skelecket Thomas Nesworth, Mayor of London, gave to the fishmonger's company certain tenements for which they are bound to allow four scholars, that is to say, two at Oxon and two at Cambridge, to each of them four pounds per annum, as also to poor people prisoners in Ludgate something yearly. Query Anthony Wood, De His, Manuscript Aubrey 26, page 1. End of Appendix 1《Appendix 2 of Brief Lives, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Brief Lives, Volume 2 by John Aubrey. Appendix 2. Aubrey's Comedy of Restoration Manners. The Country Rebel. Act 2, Scene 3. A Fair Room. Enter Sir Eglamour, Lady Euphrasia, Lady Pamela, to them, Sir Eubly Nestor, then Squire Fitzale. Sir J. Fitzale. Sir Eglamour, your most humble servant. Sir Eglamour. Sir John Fitzale, the welcomest man alive. Fitzale. Save you, ladies. I'm come to wait on you at the famous revel here, to help celebrate the festival of St. Peter. Ladies. Most kindly done, Sir John. We heard you strictly kept his vigil last night at Justice Wagstaff's. Fitzale. So strict that none of us have been abed to-night. That's the truth on it. I believe since the conquest St. Peter had never a merrier eve observed. Ladies. Pray, Sir John, favour us to let us hear some of the mirth. Fitzale. Why, ladies, yesterday we Cheshire gentlemen met at a barrel of ale at the bull-ring, where we sufficiently baited both bull and barrel, and having well drank there, stayed and tail till five o'clock in the afternoon, we were invited to the justices, where being come into the great hall we met for a good omen the servants labouring at heaving into the cellar a tierce of french wine newly brought by the barge from chester faith we had a frolic and voted it nemine contradicente to have it set a broach in the midst of the hall to work we go and we four knights mount the tierce bestride it like the quarter files d'amont upon one horse then we drank his majesty's health the queen's and the royal family then fair ladies he bows your two healths, then our mistresses, then God knows who, till the cook knocked for supper. So the tierce was reprieved till after supper, her guard set over it. As we were going to sit down to supper in the parlour, a sudden quarrel arose between Sir Fastidious Overween and Captain Quarrelsome about precedency. Two cuffs they fell, all in confusion. The ladies cried out, Sir Fastidious great periwig was thrown into the fire, and made an abominable stink. Sir Eubel bless me what unheard of rudeness this to be done at a gentleman's house and by gentlemen senators parliamentary justices of the peace sir j fitzale in the scuffle the kayup of captain quarrelsome's sword hitched in the cupboard of glasses down came all the glasses of the butler with a most dreadful esclate but this is not all the crossbar of sir fastidious sword hitched in my old lady's veil and plucked it off together with her periwig and showed her poor bald old death's head sir you Lord bless me, Sir J. Fitzale. The justice and I struck him between em and parted em, and with something more trouble than staving and tailing dog and bull, they were reconciled and sate down opposite to each other. To a noble supper we sat down. After supper dessert was brought. My country gentlemen catched and snatched like schoolboys, and gobbled up the sweetmeats like ducks, and, and being very drunk, some put even marmalade into their pockets. A noble carpet in the parlour trailed on the ground, which with their dirty boots they made the fair edge and border as dirty as a woman's saddle-cloth. Supper being ended, faith, the justice would have the other bout at the butt for a confirmation of friendship between the two antagonists. I could not refuse to help carry on such a good work of charity, so we drank friendly on till two o'clock in the morning. By that time you may well think our brains were well warmed. We sung, hooped, hallowed, jubiled, set the kennel of hounds all in alarm, we had the wenches and all the servants of the house to participate in the great jubilee. Well, about daybreak, t'was the general vote for the unhinging of the cellar door and throw it from the precipice of the cliff into the Dee, the good old door that has turned on his hinges for these two centuries of years in the days of his hospitable ancestors was taken down, and by four tall fellows borne to the cliff, 
Oba's loud music played before, the bearers followed, and then came the chief mourners, the butler, brewer, and pantler, weeping with blubbered eyes, for the decease of that had turned out and doubled in the days of his hospitable ancestors. It was an ill omen of the fall of that ancient family. Sir Eubel, and they said well. I knew their justice's grandfather and great-grandfather too. They kept twelve men in blue coats and badgers. We had no such doings in their days. They were sober, prudent, kept good, well-ordered hospitality. We are like to have a fine world when Parliament men and justices shall give such lewd example. Fitzale. Well, after the mourners, we came with our levets and clarions, then the rest. We had the sow-gelder there, who loud performs the through bass. The dogs took it in turn, too, along the river into Chester, and set all the dogs there barking. Ladies. I warrant the country people thought you mad. Sir Eubel. And well they might, by my troth or that there was an insurrection of the fanatics. Fitzale. My tall lads, hand down the door, and commit it from the cliff to the deep. Down, down it falls, but yet with several bounds it made, as with disdain to be at last so served for its long and faithful service. Into the river Dee, down dash it fell, and away towards Chester swims, but seemed to give a mournful je ne sais quoi, and a sighing seemed to say, those that I trusted do my trust betray. Not Orpheus' harp did swim more solemnly, the Thracian dames at Orpheus did discou, whose head and harp they into Hebrus flang, were not with greater rage possessed than we. Lady Euphrasia. I swear, Sir John, you have made a very poetical description of it. Sir J. Fitzale. Ah, I steeped my muse last night in Agonippe. Sir Eubel Nestor. Ah, the justice now may well be said to keep an open house. Sir J. Fitzale. Sir Eglamour, the justice intends to wait on any ladies come and dine with you. So fastidious and the captain comes with him, as also the bull-baiters, his old companions of the tap, neither wit nor learning, impudent swearers, bestial drinkers, a peck at a draught, hacking blades, huge colosses, with long swords, horse-skin belts, old reformados of Charles I, sad wretches, old sink-caters, bacon-faced fellows, centaurs that look as if they could not prove the Christian, down their beards and dyed with mundungus, now, ladies, look to yourselves, for every one will have a smack at your lips with their unsanctified moustaches. Ladies, bless us! I'll not come near em if they be such. Fitzale. The justice and myrmidons are to drink up a thousand of ale at Mother Mackerel's. Sir Eubel. Drink as in the days of Pantagruel. Fitzale. Plato says perpetual drunkenness is the reward of virtue. The Country Revel, Act Three, Scene Three. An alehouse bower. Enter Mrs. Mackerel. Justice Wagstaff, Sir John Fitzale, Captain Exceptious Quarrelsome, Sir Fastidious Overween, the Sowgelder, and Sir Hugh the Vicar, Myrmidons. Justice Wagstaff, Mother Marjorie, a merry revel to you. I am come to see you according to custom. Marjorie, I thank your worship. You are my old guest and acquaintance, and that does stand my friend with the excise men. Sir Fastidious, Prithee, give us a cup of the best revel ale. We are come to drink not less than a thousand of ale before we go. Justice Wagstaff sings. Come fill us a thousand jugs, etc. Marjorie curtsies. Mr. Justice Wagstaff, a good health to your worship. Wagstaff, I thank thee, Marjorie. How does do, Peg? First I must have a kiss. Come, let's fancy her half a crown apiece. She's a good-natured girl. They give. Sir John Fitzale. Sir Hugh. Drink to the king's health. Sir Hugh takes off his glass. Supernaculum. Sir J. Fitzale. Bravely done, parson. A true sponge of the Church of England, in faith. Sir Hugh. I am one of the old red-nosed clergy, orthodox and canonical. Sir J. Fitzale. You help solemnise the rebel. End of Appendix 2. End of Brief Lives, Volume 2. By John Aubrey.